today's webinar. We are right at the top of the hour, so we're going to give a few seconds for people to join. I see people trickling into the room. All right, well, hopefully you can hear us. Um, we have Maureen in the chat uh, who is here for technical assistance if you need some help along the way. But please feel free, go ahead and introduce yourself. Say hello, say where you're joining from today in the chat. And I will hand it over to Samantha to get us rolling. Oh, Samantha, are you going to do the intro to the webinar? Or maybe you dropped off. I will start off by saying we've been having some small internet connections here at our university. So please apologize. I'll, well, I'll apologize to start with if one of us drops off. Okay, thank you, Lissa, and thank you for joining us today. This webinar, webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances education in the ATE community by offering trainings, cultivating a community of people who care about evaluation, researching emerging topics in ATE evaluation, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out the Evaluate website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with several other resources. You can download them by following the link on the right side of your screen. And this recording will also be available within a couple of days, and we'll make sure to email you the link to the materials, as well as um, the survey, which we'll tell you about at the end, and the video. I'm Samantha Hooker. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lissa wilson Becho is our presenter today. She's the Principal Investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd also like to recognize those who worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including Maureen Green, who Lissa told you is with us for technical support in the chat, Lori Wingate from the Evaluate team, and we also want to thank Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, Emery DeWitt from Mentor Connect for their input in making this webinar. And as always, we thank Carolyn Williams Noren, our copy editor. Before we get started, I just want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now, Lisa. Thanks, Samantha. Well, I am so excited to be here with you all today. I'm actually going to go ahead and shut off our cameras for now so that we can focus on the slides, but we will turn them back on when we get to our question and answer breaks. All right, so I am so excited to be with here, here with you to talk about program evaluation. So we have a lot to talk about in the next hour, but I want to begin today by checking in with you. Because often we find that people bring some assumptions, some feelings, frankly, some baggage with them into conversations about evaluation. And that is completely fair. I just want to know what you're all bringing in with you today to today's webinar. So using the chat box to the right side of your screen that you've all been using to introduce yourself, thank you so much, share one word that comes to mind when you hear the term evaluation. So one word when you hear the word evaluation. So no judgments here, don't hold back, good or bad, I wanna hear it. All right, so I see some submissions coming in. So Laura says counting, Shelly says results, Adrian says complex, that's a good one. Larry says data, ooh, Frank says scoring, that's a good one. I see Valerie says frustration, Michael says black box, that's a great one actually. Kevin says grading, that's interesting. Billy says needed, Leonard says money sign. I love it. <laughs> yes, all of that and more, right? Time consuming, feedback, steps, objective. It's a good one. Opportunity, ooh, thanks Norm. And OSIS is guidance, I love that one too. Well, thank you all for your honesty. Um, I think that these are all completely fair and acceptable associations, but I'll tell you right now that I have one primary goal for today. And that is for you all to walk away with a more hopeful and positive outlook on what program evaluation can do for you 
and why you want to partner with your evaluation team for the sake of your students, your faculty, and your project. So many of you today might be like my friend Jen. So meet Jen Generickson. She has a great idea for an ATE proposal. She's working with her colleagues to pull together specifics about her activities and her work plan. In reading the AT solicitation, she comes across a section on evaluation. So it states that all ATE funded work must be evaluated. She's never had an ATE or NSF grant before, and she's not entirely sure what that means. In fact, she has a lot of questions. Things like, what even is evaluation? Why should she do it? Uh, how much is this going to cost her project? Who can evaluate her project? And how, where can she find an evaluator? So in today's webinar, I intend to answer all of these questions and any other questions that come up for you along the way. So we are going to have multiple question breaks throughout our webinar, but please feel free. We have Samantha and Maureen moderating the chat. So if a question pops into your mind at any point throughout the next hour, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get to it at one of our question breaks. As a quick caveat, today is part one of a two-part series of evaluation webinars that we've created for Mentor Connect. So today is just an intro, an overview, kind of like a quick start guide to what you need to know about evaluation as prospective grantees, grants professionals, or administrators. On April 19th, in part two, we're gonna dive uh, into some of the details and specifics about how precisely to write an evaluation plan for your ATE proposals. So in both webinars, I wanna connect you back with a wealth of resources on the Evaluate website so that when you inevitably have a question about evaluation later on throughout your proposal development process, you know where to find answers. All right, so let's start with the most fundamental question of what is evaluation? So at its core, evaluation is a process of learning. Program evaluation can help to answer questions like, did my project work? Why did it work? Who did it work for? Are the project impacts equitable? What aspects of my project can be improved? And what should I do differently in the future? And the learning from an evaluation should be driven by you, the project staff, and those that are served by the project. So this could be students, faculty, or even business and industry partners. It can be really helpful to ask these groups what they might want to know about your project, what they want to learn. We'll continue to talk about this throughout the next hour, but the best evaluations are a partnership between the project team and the evaluation team. Your evaluators are there to be your partners in learning. They're not there to catch you doing something wrong. They're not there to mark you down or point out your flaws. They're not auditors. They're not there to conduct a performance review. They're there to work with you to make your project better for the sake of your project and ultimately for your students. There are no failed projects. There are no failed ATE projects. Just like in any science experiment, there are no bad data. All data are a chance for learning, for improvement. Unmet project goals are an opportunity to understand what didn't work. And knowing what doesn't work is a step closer to knowing what does work. Okay, so what does evaluation actually look like in practice? Well, boiled down, evaluation involves four main steps. First step is asking important questions about a project's process, outcomes, or other dimensions. So this is making sure that the evaluation focuses on the things that really matter, the things that you want to learn about your project. These questions then scope the rest of the evaluation. The next step is gathering evidence that will help to answer those questions. So evidence for evaluation is often gathered through research methods like focus groups, interviews, surveys, or even observations. In the ATE program, evaluations also often utilize a college's institutional data. They might use results from course evaluations, and sometimes they might include feedback from panels or experts of advisors. Then the third step, we have to make sense of that data. So we collected it, but now we need to interpret the results in order to answer those evaluation questions. So when it comes to interpreting or making meaning of the data that were collected, 
evaluations almost always look for project strengths and weaknesses. In assessing outcomes, we should determine the magnitude or the extent of the outcome and their practical significance for the people involved. And this is often done by comparing to some sort of benchmark or standard. And then the last step is, the, is to use the information, to use the evaluation findings for project improvement, for accountability, and for planning. The use of evaluation findings for decision-making is a key part of this evaluation cycle. You know, I said this was the last step, but it really isn't the final step because the evaluation should inform decisions about your next project, and this cycle of learning starts all over again. So if you're interested in learning more about what evaluation looks like, what those tasks are, what needs to be done, on our website, um, there's actually a handout that will pop into the, the handouts panel. Actually, Samantha, hopefully you can, you can do that. Um, but you'll get this handout that looks like this on the screen, and it'll have links to every resource that I mentioned today. And it's actually in the order of the webinar to make it easy for you to follow along. But this ATE evaluation task list can be a really great reference for you to understand the major tasks that are involved in an ATE evaluation. Okay, so now that Jen, and hopefully you, has a better sense of what it means to have her project evaluated, but she's still not sure of why she should do it. So why should she evaluate her project? Why should she want to evaluate her project? Well, I said it before and I'll say it again, evaluation is all about learning. We typically talk about the three main benefits that come from evaluation. First, learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project. Second, sharing those learnings back with your funder, back with the National Science Foundation. So NSF also wants to learn about what changes have happened because of their investment in your project. And third, evaluation provides evidence of the effectiveness of your project, both for your project and for others who are trying to, to do similar things. Evidence of what works can add to the larger field of technician training. So let's take a look at that first purpose. So a maxim that we frequently hear is the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. So let me say that again. The most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. So whereas, whereas research, uh, basic research is, is typically conducted for the sake of building knowledge, but evaluation is intended to inform decisions. The first purpose of evaluation is for this improvement and decisions. Utility or the usefulness of evaluation is actually a standard of quality of which evaluations are judged. So evaluation findings are intended to be used. I keep saying that though, but let's look at some examples of what it might look like to actually use your evaluation findings. So in this first example, uh, hypothetically, your evaluation findings, they might highlight a particularly effective, say, recruitment strategy for women in a cybersecurity program. So you get these findings and your project decides to really lean into the success and shift some additional resources to that recruitment strategy in order to really optimize on that. For a second example, uh, maybe your evaluator uh, shares that you are doing some faculty development workshops and faculty who participated had a particularly difficult time understanding a specific unit on semiconductors. So this might serve as a red flag to you that indicates that you might wanna revisit that unit or provide additional instructions. And for a final example, evaluations can be particularly important in highlighting issues of equity and inclusion around your project's impact. Uh, so for example, an internship program funded by your project might be particularly helpful for white students, but Hispanic students uh, say that they don't, they don't feel a sense of belonging and they can't fully engage with industry partners. So using that evaluation feedback, you can really understand what's not working for them and go back and address that. Evaluation can help unearth these patterns and give you understanding of what might need to change in your program and why. So as the future funder of your project, NSF does require an independent evaluator. In order to be compliant with the requirements of your ATE grant, you must evaluate your project. So here we have the second purpose of an evaluation is for accountability. 
Just like you want to learn about the effectiveness of your project, so does NSF. So at the basic level, evaluations enable a really high degree of accountability. Individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal resources, and the information helps NSF be accountable to Congress and justify the continued support of the ATE program. Projects funded by NSF have to submit annual reports through an online system called research.gov. So here is kind of a little snapshot of what the main report sections of that annual report look like. So in the accomplishment section, grantees are asked to report on their project goals, activities, but also their results and outcomes. So the evidence of your project's results and outcomes, these are gonna come in large part from your evaluation. Your program officer is going to expect that you upload your evaluation report in this section, but they're also looking for you to react to your evaluation findings. So that, that use of evaluation findings that we just talked about, they wanna know what you learned and then how you used those, that learning. And if you made changes along the way, you can use your evaluation findings to justify those changes. If a project encountered problems or opportunities to shift a project's focus, maybe maximize their outcomes, uh, they can substantiate that change with their evaluation findings. So I know this may seem premature to, to think about what your annual report is gonna look like, but I think it can be really helpful to understand at this point what NSF will expect from you in your reporting at the beginning of your proposal stage and knowing what you'll be asked for allows you to prepare for it now. So the third purpose of evaluation is for evidence. We hear a lot about evidence-based practices or high impact practices. We trust that systematic research and evaluation of these efforts have provided evidence that they work. Just as you have borrowed from others' successful interventions, one day someone else might borrow from your successful intervention. So your evaluation provides evidence of what works and what doesn't work, both equally important learning opportunities. Additionally, you will need this evidence of your project outcomes if you apply for another grant from NSF in the future. So when you go back to NSF in a few years to request funding for a new project, you'll actually have to begin your proposal with a section called results from prior NSF support. This subsection has to include evidence of specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate the impact of the project's activities. Again, these come from your evaluation. So it's important to consider at the start of your project, at the start of the proposal process, uh, what kind of evidence you might want to have at the end of your project. Let's actually go ahead and take a look at some examples of what those evidence statements might look like. So here is a set of three statements, three example statements that could show up in a results of prior support section in a future proposal that Jen submits. So take your time to read these examples carefully and then answer the poll to indicate which examples would be the most compelling to reviewers as evidence of outcomes. So Samantha, go ahead. Oh, I see you just did it. Go ahead and launch that poll. So the poll should pop up on the right side of your screen. So once you go ahead and read through those, decide which example of evidence you feel like is the strongest and answer in the poll. All right, I see responses coming in and I see them slowing down a bit. Okay, so I think we have over half of folks have answered and it looks like people are, are leaning towards example C. All right, let's go ahead and dig into some of these a little more. Okay, so in example A, whoop, in example A, 
we see that they only said what they were funded to do. So they really only talk about the activities. And Celeste Carter, the ATE program lead, said that this is actually really common in ATE proposals, that people just cut and paste from their prior proposal. So this definitely doesn't count as compelling evidence of outcomes. For example, B, they only reported on activities. So it includes a lot of numbers, 150 students enrolled, 300 students benefited, but these are just counts of what happened. It isn't actually evidence of what happened to the students as a result of the activities. In an example, C answers the question of so what? So what happened to these students after they participated? Well, they, their pass rates increased, they got jobs. So example C includes evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. So example C is the kind of evidence statements that we want to aim for. So I want you to think about your own proposal that you're developing right now. So imagine that your proposal is successful and that you've been funded by the NSF ATE program. Now imagine that you are in the last year of your ATE grant. What is one thing that you want to be able to say about the success of your project? So one piece of evidence that you want to be able to say at the end of your, of your project. So take a minute to think about what that one thing would be and go ahead and share it in the chat box. I know it's a hard question, but I see Adrian put something in there. Adrian said, to increase the enrollment of women in advanced manufacturing programs. That's a great one. Ellen said, 10 classes that were developed. Ellen, I would love to see you push that beyond. What next? Uh, the classes were developed and then students did what? Really pushing towards those outcomes instead of just the activities. Larry said, attract students for a new career pathway. Yeah, so what is that new career pathway going to get those students? Higher paying jobs? Uh, are you fulfilling business and industry needs? Leonard says, increase of certi cert certification access and passing. Yeah, that's a great one. Michael says, implemented the program and graduates got jobs in the field, right? We're not implementing programs just to implement programs, but we're doing it in order to get people into jobs, right? In order to fill industry needs. Jamie says, to show an increase in women working in our local industry. It's a great one. Joe says, development of IT and manufacturing apprentice programs through certification programs and job placement. Yeah. So thinking about what evidence you really want to come out of your project now is important in thinking about what kinds of learning you want to get from your evaluation. So these statements now that you're thinking about, this is what you need to hold on to as you develop your evaluation plan, as you talk with your evaluator. So if you wanna know more about what goes into the results of prior support section, uh, we do have a checklist on this topic. So it includes the NSF requirements, plus some suggestions from our team about getting the most out of this section in proposals. So even if you are just submitting your first NSF proposal, like all of you on the webinar today, uh, it, it's really not too early to start thinking about how you want to be able to talk about your accomplishments with this project in the future. Okay, so now Jen has a good grasp on what evaluation is, what it looks like in practice, and why she wants to do it. But her big question is, what is this going to cost her project? But before we dive into that question, I'm actually going to hand it over to Samantha for our first question break. Thank you, Lissa. Uh, you can go ahead and drop any questions into the chat, and I will go ahead and make sure that they're displayed on the screen and ask to Lissa.
my job today is done. Everyone is convinced about the value of evaluation and why they need it and what it is. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. <laughs> we just needed one more thumbs up vote. So I, I guess that's. No, that is fair. Okay, Joe said no questions yet. Okay. And... Okay. All right, Alyssa, I've got a couple popping up. So, okay, first, uh, we were told it would be advisable to find an evaluator who's local, but we're in rural East Texas and that may be difficult. Is proximity that important? That is a great question, Fred. Um, and I, I see that Frank answered, uh, asked a question too about how to acquire, how to find an evaluator. And we're gonna talk about that more in depth as well. Um, sometimes it can be helpful, particularly when you're working with small budgets to work with a local evaluator because it cuts down on their travel time. It's really helpful for an evaluator to be able to do site visits to your project to really understand the work that you're doing and your team and just have those face-to-face -face conversations. However, I have seen evaluators do this job virtually, particularly through COVID. Um, that is something that uh, still moved forward. Um, so I recognize that they're not always evaluators as your neighbors. And so you can certainly look outside of your local context, but we're going to talk more about what kinds of qualifications, skills, and experience you should really be looking for in an evaluator for your project. Okay. And Lissa, one of the other questions was about credentials, which I know that, you know, you just said we'll cover in the next session. Um, there was one question on the breakdown of evaluators that you showed on the slide in the poll, A, B, and C, um, and just that according to their understanding, um, there is no C in evaluators. And so that may be answered in the next question as well when we dig a little bit more into. Oh, credential. I understand. Correct. Yeah, I could just answer that now, Leonard. That there is no specific credential in the U.S. actually. Um, Canada actually does have a, a certified evaluator credential. Um, however, that's not actively used in the U.S. So it can feel really tricky to find the right person um, because there really isn't that type of required credential. All right, well, we will move ahead forward. I know we have more question breaks as well. So thank you all for your questions so far. Okay, and I'm sure none of you asked this question because I said it was coming up, but uh, we get asked a lot, right? How much do evaluation, project evaluations cost and what should you write into your budget? Well, here is the excerpt from the AT solicitation about evaluation requirements. It states that the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. And that is certainly important, but <laughs> I'm sure you could tell that it's not very satisfying to people who just want to get a number into their budget that they can really work with. So the general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's costs should be allocated for evaluation. And that's evaluation in any context. So that's a great place to start. And then you can go up or down from there, depending on what level or what type of evaluation is really needed for your project. So there are a variety of factors that can influence the project's budget. So some things that you might wanna think about in terms of whether you should go above or below that 10% rule are things like the following. So the first one is the type of data that evaluation will be collected. So qualitative data tends to be more time intensive when it comes to collecting, cleaning, and analyzing it. Therefore, evaluations that rely heavily on qualitative data might be more expensive, but they really get at different types of questions. If what you want to learn leans towards the questions of why and not what, qualitative data is really gonna be uh, what you're looking for. Another factor is whether the data has already been collected or whether it's new. 
uh, existing data will be less time consuming, or I should say maybe less time consuming for the evaluation team to get their hands on compared to if they need to gather that new data. Um, and gathering that new data might be more expensive. Different evaluators, they interact with projects differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who will be really responsive to changes in your activities or timelines or data needs, that might be more costly than a rigid, less responsive evaluation. Similarly, evaluators who are involved more with meetings or decision makings, they also might be more costly. Evaluation efforts themselves can be shared between external evaluation teams and internal evaluation efforts. So more assistance from the internal evaluation might reduce the burden on your external evaluators, which in turn would make your evaluation less costly. Travel time is our next one. So we just talked about this a little bit, but travel time also affects the evaluation budget. So uh, if someone has to travel, say, from across the country to do a site visit for your project, it's going to add to their budget. Whereas if you can find someone more local, it would cut down on that budget line. So I want to share these not as a formula to write an evaluation budget, but as some guideposts to understand how that 10% rule of thumb might be affected by the type of evaluation your project is looking for, for the types of evaluation questions you want to ask. The fact of the matter is, if evaluation is going to bring value to your project, you have to fund it adequately. So let's look at an example of what this might look like in practice. So remember our friend Jen. Well, let's say that she is asking for the maximum amount for ATE projects funded through the small new to ATE program track. So her total project budget would be $350,000 over three years. Most academic institutions apply a facilities and administrations rate called an FNA or sometimes referred to as an indirect rate. All institution rates are different, but let's say that Jen's institution FNA rate is 25%. So that means that 70% of her total budget would be made up of indirect funds, leaving her with 280,000 of a budget for direct operating costs. So as a reminder, that 10% rule of, for evaluations, it's actually calculated on direct operating budget. So we're using that $280,000 to calculate the 10%. So if Jen decides that 10% of her direct budget is gonna go to evaluation, it means that there would be $28,000 yep, $28, uh, over the lifespan of the grant, over those three years. And so that would break down to about $9,333 per year. So these funds would go towards an evaluator's time, as well as their travel expenses and their overhead costs. There might be other miscellaneous expenses in there, um, but these are the main ones. So an evaluation budget should reflect what's needed for a given project. So this is really just a rough guideline, but I hope it gives you an idea of what that is. So Jen is on her way to understanding what evaluation is and what it might cost. We'll tackle her questions about who can evaluate her ATE project and where to find them next. But I know that there tends to be a lot of questions specifically around evaluation budgets. So we have placed a short question break here before we move on. Um, so I'm gonna open it up or I'm gonna pass it over to Samantha to open it up for questions. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, we could also move on as well. Thank you, Lissa. And again, go ahead and add any questions you might have uh, from the budget section into the window. The budgets are hard because you know you're in this beginning stage where you're not even sure what your activities are never mind what your evaluation plan is but there's always this chicken and egg problem like you'll ask your evaluator what the evaluation costs and they'll ask you what you have budgeted and then you feel like you just go in circles okay and Lisa, we do have a question um, does NSF have a minimum and max amount for eval spending? Valerie, that's a great question. Um, they do not have a stated written in black and white minimum and maximum. 
some program officers will come back to you after your proposal is done and have questions about your evaluation budget or, or negotiate that with you, um, depending on that work. Uh, but that really does actually change between uh, program officers at NSF. I think the most important thing is the budget justification, is to be very clear about where that evaluation budget is being spent and why you're asking for that money. Okay, thank you. And Ginger was wondering <laughs> if they go over the 10% or under, um, do they need to add justifications of why? I think you should always add a justification whether you're exactly at 10% over or under. Because at the end of the day, your proposal is really just an argument to the reviewers and to the program officer of what you're gonna be doing with that money. So the more you can explain that, and the more you can justify that the use of those funds, the better off you'll be. Would you anticipate negotiating the budget amount with the evaluator? And is there a percentage that would cause NSF to question the evaluation budget? Mm. Constance, let me tackle that those questions one by one. So uh, there will always be a conversation. I don't want to call it a negotiation, but conversation with whichever evaluator you end up working with. Everyone has different rates. Um, some evaluators work as independent consultants. Some work at four-year institutions. And so you're always going to be uh, working with different, say, overhead costs or different funding structures. Um, but I think that even evaluators are going into this conversation with the, the general 10% rule in mind. And I hope that every evaluator will go back to you and ask, at the end of the day, what is the question you're looking to answer? What things are you looking to learn? Because that is really gonna affect whether or not you go over or under that 10%. And then is there a percentage that would cause NSF to question the evaluation budget? Just like the, you know, there's no stated minimum or maximum. Um, every reviewer, every program officer comes in with different assumptions about what should be spent on evaluation. So back to that idea of justifying what you wrote into the budget, how will that money be used? And being pretty specific about it, right? So not just writing travel, you know, $10,000, but travel for what? For site visits. And then how are those site visits being used in the evaluation plan, right? You're not just flying your evaluator to come visit you to have dinner, even though that is also generally helpful to have dinner with your evaluator. But there is intentional purposes, reasons that adds to your learning and your project improvement that you're spending that money. What if a college requires three estimates? Yes, Madeline, we are going to talk about this in much more detail later on because the procurement process of evaluators gets messy real fast. If the project is completed in two years rather than three, can the budget be reduced? Also, if there are two fiscal agents writing a collaborative, do we need to separate evaluations? Mm. Um, if there are two fiscal agents writing a collaboration, you do not need you do need separate evaluation. Uh, let me take this back. I've seen both, actually. I've seen collaborative grants, one at institution A, one at institution B, and they both have a separate evaluator for their efforts. I've seen them where they have the same evaluator. And depending on how you are putting in that collaborative proposal, depends on whether you'll have a single evaluation plan or two. Um, in terms of your first question, to be honest, I have never heard of an ATE project wrapping up in two years rather than using their whole time because it seems like there's always more things to do and more things to learn. Okay, and that is the last of our questions. All right. Well, thank you for all those questions. Let's jump into the next segment of content. All right, so this starts to get a lot of your questions as well. So who can do the evaluation, right? So our friend Jen, she has a lot of smart people on her team. So she's wondering if they could just do the evaluation internally. Well, the short answer to that question is no, they can't, because the AT program specifically states that the evaluator must be independent of the project. So our first question we should tackle is what counts as independent? 
Well, according to the ATE program solicitation, the evaluator may be employed at the project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit that has a different reporting line than the project's home unit. So this could be something like a different academic department or an institutional research office. And you know, while some large institutions might have evaluation capacity in other departments, this can become practically impossible at smaller institutions. NSF asks the evaluator to be independent in order to provide a sense of objectivity and validity to the evaluation findings. So sometimes you're just gonna have to do a gut check. Can this person objectively evaluate my project? Will there be any incentive for them to sway the evaluation results one way or another? If you're on the fence about this, if you're not sure, if you, if you think your college, your institution might be too small to really do this, it's better to go with someone outside of your institution. An evaluator from the outside of your institution, from this big wide world, uh, it has, they have a higher level of independence and they'll likely be able to tell you with, they'll be able to tell you like it is without political ramifications from their administrators. But particularly in that big wide world, it can feel really difficult to find an evaluator that's right for your projects. Small new to AT projects can be particularly difficult. So when looking for an evaluator, it's important to know, like we said before, that there's no specific degree or certification that requires one to call oneself an evaluator. There are educational programs out there, there are certificates, but there's nothing that's required. Um, there are a wide variety of companies and organizations that conduct project evaluations. Some are small evaluation consultants and others are large evaluation centers. So sometimes these large evaluation centers, they might be based at four-year institutions or large research conglomerates. So what's really important is actually looking at the skills and experience of that person you might want to work with. So here are some things to look for when you're searching for an evaluator. So first, you wanna be really careful to look for someone who has experience as an evaluator. You know, I think the term evaluation, evaluator, it gets used in a lot of different contexts. So you'll see a lot of people who may have actually only done research and research projects, but they apply to be an evaluator or they respond to an evaluation RFP. Um, so really asking about what projects have you evaluated? What did that evaluation look like is really important. But, you know, Evaluation process does involve some research skills around data collection or analysis. So uh, it's also good to look for someone who has strong research skills in addition to the evaluation experience. It's also good to have a good communicator, someone who will be responsive to your situation. And it can be really helpful to have someone who has an understanding of NSF or two-year colleges. So for new to ATE projects, it can be particularly helpful to have an evaluator that has prior experience evaluating an ATE project. So it's not always uh, easy to find someone with this perfect mix of credentials. So let's help Jen select an evaluator for her project. So as Samantha goes ahead and launches the poll for this question, let's take a moment to review the credentials of three uh, potential evaluators for Jen and then use the poll that should appear, yep, there it goes, to the right side of your screen to determine which evaluator you think would be best for Jen. Or if you have reservations, uh, if you have additional questions that you might ask, go ahead and use the chat to explain any of your concerns. See a lot of responses rolling in. We have about half, a little more than half the audience has answered. But you know, I see this slower than before, right? Yeah, and I see some some people writing concerns in there. Yeah, Constance says evaluator B has a lot on their plate already, right? Yes. 
Well, let's go ahead and take a look at each of these evaluators individually. So, you know, sometimes it can be really difficult to tell if an evaluator will be a good fit from their resume alone. And you really might need to give them a call or send them an email to ask some follow-up questions. So for evaluator A, they seem to have some good knowledge of two-year colleges, technical education, and student services. But I would really want to know more about their experiences as an external evaluator of funded grants. Accreditation has a lot in common with project evaluation, but it's not the same thing. So it'd be really good to dig into more understanding of that. Evaluator B looks like they have great credentials when it comes to evaluation, but I'd want to know how much time they have, just like Constant pointed out. Uh, if they're already working with 25 other evaluations, you know, how does this, what does this really look like? And I would also expect that they would have a pretty big team working with them. So I would also ask who exactly, who specifically is working, would be working on this project and what are their individual credentials? Additionally, Evaluator B says they have experience on NSF funded projects, but I would ask them directly, do you have experience on ATE projects? Because like we said before, particularly for small new to ATE um, projects, that can be really helpful navigating the systems and the, and the data needs that come up in these types of evaluations. And then for Evaluator C, they certainly know the two-year college context and NSF, but it's not clear if they have any experience when it comes to research methods or running evaluations. So I would ask about those things. So you'll notice that there is no perfect answer here, right? It's pretty rare to find the perfect evaluator based on their resume alone. So it's always good to follow up with questions and ask for additional information. So to help with this process, Evaluate has pulled together a list of questions that you might want to ask an evaluator to determine if they're going to be the right fit for you in your project. Um, so an evaluator should fit your project and your team in multiple ways. So not only their skills in evaluation, but also their working style and how they approach evaluation. The more you feel connected with your evaluator, the better the potential for your evaluation. All right, so now Jen has a better idea of who she might be looking for, but where does she look? Well, Evaluate has done some research around this, and most ET projects actually find their evaluator through word of mouth. So make sure to ask your colleagues or other ATE project staff that you know if they had an evaluator that they liked. But I also know that that answer isn't really helpful, particularly if you're just starting off and you don't happen to know a lot of other people in the ATE community. Unfortunately, we don't have a, like a master list of all the possible evaluators who could work with your ATE project. However, I do have some good suggestions on where you might find an evaluator that could meet your needs. So your first option, the American Evaluation Association hosts a national directory of evaluators. So in this directory, you can search by area of expertise or location. For NSF projects, we really suggest that you use search terms such as STEM, education, uh, CTE, career technical education, community college, or NSF. All of these can really help narrow it down. There are also local affiliates of the American Evaluation Association. So these are regional groups, and sometimes they have their own directory, which might actually list people who are not in the national directory. So while an evaluator doesn't have to be in your local area, like we were talking about before, sometimes it can cut down on travel costs in your evaluation budget, or it can actually also increase their awareness of your local needs. Expanding the bench is another great place to look. Uh, they are an initiative committed to diversifying evaluation and evaluating culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. They also have a searchable database of evaluators. And similar to the AEA database, we would really recommend AT projects using those search terms like STEM education, community college, two-year schools, CTE, um, to get to an evaluator that has similar experience. And finally, ATE Central and Evaluate partner to host this map of evaluators who are currently evaluating ATE projects. So these evaluator profiles will list information such as the company name, contact information, their geographic location, 
but also things like the ATE projects and disciplines that they have evaluated, and some will indicate whether or not they're accepting new clients or not. So all of these links are actually found on a, on a resource in your handout called the Guide to Finding and Selecting an Evaluator for AT Proposals. So when you get to that stage and you're ready to find and select an evaluator for your project, go ahead and take a look at this guide. It has a great summary of the information we've talked about today, along with more things to think about. Now, Madeline asked about procurement before, right? So everything I've just been saying assumes that you're able to start looking for an evaluator now, before you've been funded. But this process of procuring an evaluator can be a bit more difficult depending on your institution's policies. I truly wish I could give you a straightforward map of what this looks like at your institution, but unfortunately it's really different in each state and sometimes at each institution. So our first recommendation, your first step that you should do is having a conversation with someone in your procurement or contracts office. So there should be someone at your institution who can really tell you the specifics of the policies. But to give you a broad idea, there are two basic paths. So in the first path, your institution will allow you to work with an evaluator pre-award, meaning right now while you're developing your proposal. This can be a really great way to connect with your evaluator and get their insights and feedback, not only for the evaluation plan, but also on your project's goals and objectives. Evaluators spend a lot of their time thinking about what constitutes meaningful outcomes and how to measure them. So this can be a really great resource. So in this situation, you can start searching for and choose your evaluator. Um, many evaluators will conduct this work upfront without payment. Uh, they work with the agreement that they'll be hired as the evaluator if you receive the grant. But make sure to talk with your evaluator upfront about how they'll handle these situations and what kind of boundaries they might place around their time and effort in the pre-award stage. Once again, a broken record, talk to your procurement's office about what this process looks like, because maybe you can choose an evaluator before you're awarded, but you might need to get three separate quotes from people. You might need to uh, jump through certain hoops to justify why you are choosing one person over another. So in the second path, your institution might say that you need to wait entirely until your project is funded in order to even talk to an evaluator. So this means that you will not be able to have an external evaluator write your evaluation plan for your proposal. You or someone on your project team will then need to write your evaluation plan. So I know this might seem really overwhelming, but know that there are a lot of AT projects who are in a similar boat. And Evaluate has a lot of resources that can support you if you're going through this path. So first, Evaluate just launched a new resource on, uh, that looks at navigating the evaluator procurement process. So we hope that this guide can give you an overview of what this process could look like and some direction on what to ask your institutional procurement office. But again, it, it all goes back to your individual policies. So make sure you're checking with your procurement's office. Second, Evaluate has a checklist for what content should be included in your evaluation plan for your AT proposal. So this checklist is a list of the exact information um, that you'll need to write and is actually what we're going to dive into during our next webinar on April 19th. So I'm providing this checklist here in case you're ready to get started, but know that we're going to walk through every bullet point on this checklist in April. Additionally, Evaluate offers free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in developing evaluation plans. So anyone can take advantage of our ATE evaluation coaching, but I've seen it be particularly useful for those who are writing ATE proposals who can't contract with an evaluator in the pre-award stage. So you can read more information or request a meeting with one of our three wonderful coaches on our website. All right, well, Jen is feeling pretty good about evaluation now, and I hope you are too. So we have one more question break to close out our webinar today. So please ask any and all questions that you might have about evaluation. I'll hand it over to Samantha. 
Thank you, Alyssa. Um, there were a couple questions about the timeline of when to hire an evaluator, you know, when they should be looking for them, but it looks like your explanation has answered those. Um, so if there's any additional questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. All right, Joe is looking forward to part two in April. We've got a thumbs up from Leonard. Okay, uh, Lissa, could you repeat the rule about working with an in-house evaluator? Absolutely. So you are allowed to work with an evaluator who works at the same institution as your project as long as there is no reason to expect that they cannot provide an objective evaluation for you. So for example, um, if you are their supervisor, that's a pretty obvious uh, reason that someone shouldn't be evaluating your project if they report to you. Um, if you report to them, they also shouldn't be evaluating your project. If they have any other budget line on your project budget. So say uh, they're also going to be a collaborator for some element of your project, but they're only involved a little bit, but they're still getting paid as a project staff, not as a separate evaluator. Then they do not count as independent either. So really considering, is this person removed enough um, that there's no other influence on what they say about your project besides what the data says. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we're all set on the questions. And you know, I, so. Samantha's gonna go into this and say connect with us, but I will also say beforehand that it, it, I know that this is a process, right? And this is just the beginning. And so as you go through your proposal development, as you are trying to find an evaluator, writing an evaluation plan, please don't, don't hesitate to, to email me directly, ask questions, reach out to anyone on the Evaluate team. She really stole my thunder there, didn't she? <laughs> Should put a poll out. Um, just kidding. Yes, please connect with us. I've put a link there for our LinkedIn page. That's where you're gonna find our most current information on upcoming events, uh, helpful evaluation resources, tips and tricks. Um, don't forget to bookmark our website. Um, you can see it listed there. And that's where you're gonna find um, a really good source of knowledge, um, helpful um, information for you as you move forward and a sense of community as you uh, work on your potential projects.